Howdy folks, Shell Presto here. So today is a little exciting. I realized that I've got a few videos at various stages of doneness that all feature something in common. They're my redesigns of public domain characters. So I thought we could do an occasional series. Occasional series is newspaper speak for a series that doesn't have a set schedule. That is, whenever I have a piece of artwork that falls into this public domain redesign theme, I'll post it as such. Like a long-term, ongoing project. For those not in the know, public domain means something that has fallen out of copyright, something that is free for anyone to use. In the U.S., that means anything published before January 1st, 1923. This includes things like a whole bunch of Wizard of Oz books, but not the Ruby Slippers, uh, Grimm's Fairy Tales, and Edgar Rice Burroughs books, like Tarzan and A Princess of Mars. There are also a few other ways that something can enter the public domain, but I'll talk about that in another video. It's also worth noting that copyright terms and law varies from country to country, and that you may have to do a bit of research to learn what the rules are in your country. Uh, I'll be talking about it in terms of the U.S. of A. because that's where I hail from. Today I'm doing my take on Dejah Thoris, the Martian princess from the John Carter books. Edgar Rice Burroughs was the groundbreaking sci-fi adventure author who created her. If you're a fan of Tarzan, or have watched anything that had the idea of a secret land inside the earth where dinosaurs exist, then you have some knowledge of the works by, or inspired by, Edgar Rice Burroughs. Now, the joy of a book being in the public domain is that it's free to read. If you look up A Princess of Mars on Project Gutenberg, that's gutenberg.org, you can read it in a variety of formats, HTML, PDF, ebook, etc. It's also worth noting that mining the public domain is an excellent source of ideas. While you can't use Ariel from Disney's The Little Mermaid, they got the idea for her from Hans Christian Andersen's Little Mermaid fairy tale. Uh, you know, you can't use Disney's Belle, but they took her from the French novel Beauty and the Beast, which you can mine, etc., uh, etc. Et At the end of the day, if it's good enough for Disney to get ideas from, well, why shouldn't you? You can copyright your idea based on the public domain, that's what Disney does, or you can share it with the world through Creative Commons, but that's a whole other discussion. Ascension Epoch uses a Creative Commons attribution share-alike license for our books, and I encourage you to check out creativecommons.org for more information on that. Anyway, let's dive into the art part of this video. When I redesign a public domain character, I try to do two things. Firstly, to pay respect to the character as they were originally portrayed, especially as described in the text, if there was text. Secondly, I try to put my own spin on it to make a stamp that says, Presto did this. Now, these elements can be at odds with each other. An artist can depart wildly from the original interpretation, but with a bit of work they can gel well together. There is one problem with designing Dejah Thoris that my husband is always quick to point out, and it's entirely true. She, and everyone else in the John Carter Mars books, are new. The Pellucidar at the Earth's core books are too. Let Burroughs create a new, non-Earth crust dwelling civilization, and sure enough, they don't believe in clothes except perhaps for utilitarian pieces like belts to help you carry things. This may make you think that his books would be racy or debaucherous, but quite the contrary. It's handled very matter-of-factly and becomes a background detail very quickly. Burroughs' books are quite clean, straight-up adventure stories. 
but when designing for a major audience and in trying to keep my channel PG-13-ish, well, we have to go with a bikini, don't we? The original book did have images, and beautifully painted ones at that. They added clothes, too, because, well, despite science fiction threatening to rot the brains of youth, you didn't want to be too scandalous in major or minor publications at the time. In the original illustrations, all the Martians wore robes, and John Carter wore a shirt and tunic-looking wrap, so those aren't necessarily accurate. A bikini isn't perfect, but it's a bit closer to the source material. Also, in the original illustrations, there was a beautifully designed headpiece and some accompanying jewelry, but there weren't too many pictures in the book, and in the few that there were, the lighting and angles made it hard to pick out details. In the end, I kept the curves of the original design, but went with four waves on the diadem instead of three, and moved them to the sides instead of centering them. I then embellished with little chains, trying to keep everything looking delicate. I also had another driving force in this design. The channel Art a la Carte put out a challenge to join her in her monthly birthstone drawing. I had ideas for Dejah Thoris bubbling around in my mind for years, but this was the instigating force to do this piece. So those gems in the design, of course, became the August birthstone, rubies. It seemed even more natural since she's a red Martian. So, no, that isn't a bad sunburn she's got there. Uh, later on, you'll see in the final image, I go in and tint Dejah Thoris's skin even more red. Uh, you can check out Art a la Carte's excellent drawing and see all the other interpretations of this theme, including mine, on her channel. I then carried that sort of wavy horn shape from the diadem down into the bikini. It's good to use the same shapes repeatedly in a design to give it a sense of unity. If you overdo it, it can feel forced and lazy, but I think I hit safely between the nice goalposts of unity here. As a side note, a lot of my unseen scrapped designs often overuse the same shapes, and I have to redesign them to omit some of the shapes and toss a new one in to give a sense of excitement and variety. I could have given her just a giant ruby to look at, but my husband, Mike, who often gives me exciting, excellent suggestions, said I should have her gazing into H.G. Wells' crystal egg. It's a scrying tool that appears in a prequel story to War of the Worlds that allows you to gaze into Mars's landscape and see what's going on on that planet. Wells was gloriously vague about what the egg looked like, so I was happily able to make the egg whatever size, design, and color I wanted. I made it red to go with the ruby theme, of course, which coincides very nicely with Mars being the red planet. Uh, then I added a stylized planetary astrological symbol for Mars to it, as if someone carefully and beautifully labeled the egg, which I hope makes the viewer wonder if there are other such wondrous scrying tools for other planets and locations. I originally intended to watercolor this piece, and I still do. I need the practice with my newer paints. So I only penciled it, and I use Prismacolor Color Erase pencils, which are great. Uh, I just got them, and I'm really falling in love with erasable colored pencils in general. The soft, colored lines blend really nicely with tr traditional coloring methods. But to hit the deadline for this piece, because of the art a la carte video, I temporarily scrapped my watercolor plans and went ahead with digital coloring which I can generally do quicker. However, the color from the lines, uh, the pencil lines, didn't transfer well with the select color channel lock transparent pixels method for line art on Photoshop. So I had to make the lines a single color. I went with a richer, deeper red because of this. Otherwise, this was a pretty standard digital coloring job. I just fill in flat colors for each element on its own layer, 
skin on one layer, hair on another, the pillow on another, etc. Then click Lock Transparent Pixels on the Layer menu and go back in with a soft edge brush and maybe 75% to 85% flow to add shading and highlights. I usually add a tiny bit of purple to my shadow colors too. Um, one key to making a really convincing piece is to add some hard edge shadows as well though. You'll see her top leg casts a hard edge shadow onto her bottom leg. Her, had, her head casts a hard edge shadow onto her neck and shoulder, uh, etc. So I use a uh, harder edge brush for those areas. For the background, I had originally intended to do a Martian landscape, but when a deadline looms, plans change. Uh, instead, I grabbed a quaint-looking map of Mars from Camille Flammarion, made in 1884, conveniently also in the public domain. I tinted it slightly green to make the red tones in the foreground really pop, and then just added a free texture over the entire background to give it all a worn map sort of feel. It's worth noting that copyright and trademark are two different things. So while Burroughs' stories and characters published before 1923 are in the public domain, certain names are still trademarked and you need to watch out for that. So while you can use Tarzan as a character in your own story or comic, you can't use the word Tarzan in the title because that would be a trademark violation. Also, I like to remind folks, when I remember to, that this video is drastically sped up. What's 15 or 20 minutes to you was, in actuality, 6 or 7 hours for me. Uh, one or two drawing and five or so coloring. So don't get discouraged if it feels like your art is taking forever to get done. Good art takes time, folks. I hope you'll take the time to look up a Princess of Mars or the Crystal Egg. I find old stories fascinating, exciting, and quite frankly nourishing to the intellect. They use vocabulary and cut a pace that's at once a bit slower but also delightfully unexpected compared to today's fiction. Not to mention it's pretty awesome to see where so many people today get their ideas from. And if you do like reading, and like my art, Perhaps you'll give our short story collection, The Martian War Chronicles, Population of Loss a try. It's four short stories of superheroes and paranormal menace set amid the carnage of the War of the Worlds. And while it doesn't feature Dejah Thoris, though she is a part of the Ascension Epoch, there are lots of great new characters and a surprisingly familiar one waiting to meet you in Population of Loss. And, of course, it's a great introduction to our Ascension Epoch universe. It's available on Amazon and Barnes & Noble's websites, among a few others. I'll, of course, include links in the description. I hope you enjoyed taking this drawing journey with me, and I hope you'll consider subscribing so you can join me again. It's a huge help if you thumbs up this video and leave a comment. I'd love to know if you've read any Edgar Rice Burroughs books, or if there's any particular public domain characters you'd like to see my interpretation of. Heck, I'd love to know if you liked Disney's John Carter movie. Yes, they mind this too. Or if you skipped it because they didn't mention Mars in the title and you had no idea who the heck John Carter was. Especially comment if you want to see my take on Ula, because I've got a sketch of that beast just waiting to be turned into a full drawing. In the meantime, thanks for watching and have an awesome day. Hey, you stuck around. Okay. I don't have any extra content that has to do with Burroughs, but maybe sorta of with another public domain author? Meet the latest addition to the DiBaggio household. A friend of ours rescued this little guy who was born to a feral mother. 
He had a pretty fierce eye infection when they found him, so his eye shows some lingering cloudiness, and, well, although kittens usually often get snapped up at the SPCA, sometimes kittens with quote-unquote defects don't get adopted. We weren't in the market for a new cat, but this little fella is pretty pleasant, so we decided to take fate into our own hands and make sure he's got a good home, a.k.a. La Casa de DiBaggio. Since he's a black cat, we needed an appropriately eerie name for the little guy. So, meet Algernon Catwood, named after Algernon Blackwood, author of such chilling and wonderfully atmospheric horror stories as The Willows and The Windigo, which also happen to be in the public domain. They're good to add to your reading list, what with Halloween quickly approaching. I also heard that black cats tend to be abused near Halloween, so grabbing one from your shelter and adding them under your own roof for protection this time of year might also be a good idea if you've ever pondered getting one. Regardless, I'm glad you stuck around to say hi to Algernon. He gives his regards, and I hope to talk to you again in the future videos. Have an awesome day, folks. Presto, over and out.